Okay, everyone, let's get started. Good morning. Uh, please be prepared today with a pencil uh, or pen and paper because there will be an activity for you all. So I hope everyone is well. Uh, thanks to the 19 of you who are here, I guess 18, because I'm one of them. Uh, Thursday, again, is always the day that uh, goes a bit beyond and uh, I hope is enriching to you. I hope this entire week has been enriching uh, because geometry is uh, by its own uh, virtue and an enriching subject. Uh, but I hope what we discussed today is going to be good for the soul. So, uh, oh, I should just remind, I feel like I'm just jumping into this too fast. Uh, homework is due uh, to tomorrow at 9 p.m. as always. And uh, Patricia's office hours are 1 p.m. today. Gabe's office hours are 3 p.m. Uh, today. Uh, tomorrow, Gabe's office hours are at 10. I think the homework is actually really easy this week. Uh, it's only seven questions long. If you haven't started, I'm sure you won't have a, a hard time finishing. It's, it's really quite rudimentary. Uh, it is not nearly as hard as the other weeks. Uh, and I partly did this for your comfort and ease to give you a little bit of a breather. Um, but I also think um, some, of the, some of the stuff that we've talked about is really actually, you know, the applications would be really, really hard and I think it would not be fair to the ninth and 10th graders. So juniors and seniors uh, know that you're, you're held to a higher standard than uh, what the homework assesses. Uh, so uh, just because you do well in this homework doesn't mean you're a master of, <laughs> of geometry. Uh, and anyway, okay. So we've discussed the following topics. We've discussed angles, lines, dimensionality. This is what we talked about on Monday. We talked about how many points you need, you know, n plus one points to define n dimensions. Uh, so one point defines no dimensions, two points defines one dimension, three points defines two dimensions, on and on and on. So uh, this was a sort of introduction to, um, you know, the, this idea of space and uh, most of the geometry itself that we talked about uh, happens in 2D. In other words, often we have a minimum of three points uh, because we are working in the plane, right? Um, we've also talked about um, sort of elementary things about angles and how to measure arcs of angles, what the meaning of an arc is. We've talked about how the sum of angles in a triangle uh, is, 360, uh, is 180 degrees. Uh, in that proof, by the way, I just wanted to add, where you might remember this triangle that I drew, and I drew another, a, a leg that, that wasn't, didn't come out as good as I thought, that was parallel to this leg, uh, and I said that this angle is equal to this angle by the, the idea of corresponding angles. And I also said that this angle is equal to this angle by alternate interior angles. But what I forgot to tell you is that um, actually just from this diagram itself, you can see uh, that the exterior angle theorem holds. And so uh, what that means is that the sum of these two, of uh, this angle alpha and this angle beta is equal to this angle delta, right? So, so the sum, so in other words, alpha plus beta is equal to delta. And delta is 180 degrees minus this angle gamma. So this is the exterior angle theorem. That the sum of the two x that the sum of the, that, that the sum of these two angles here is equal to the exterior angle. That's what this is called because it's outside the triangle. Okay, so that was just a thing I forgot to tell you. Then on Tuesday, we talked a bit about conic sections, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this today. Not much, but a, a little bit more. Uh, I, will, I won't summarize because that's, I'll give you a little uh, summary in just a few minutes. Then Patricia did a wonderful job telling you about triangles and uh, how to prove that two triangles would be similar if they're similar or congruent if they're congruent. And she gave you all the criterion, uh, all the criteria, excuse me, for congruence, SAS, SSS, ASA, AAS. And she showed you that, well, I guess I showed you, but she mentioned that SSA also, if you rearrange, uh, 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 to spell a bad word, uh, SSA is not a valid criteria. I gave a counterexample at the beginning of yesterday's lecture. Uh, similarity basically means that um, you have two figures that are off by some factor in their size. In other words, you have two similars of this, two figures of the same shape, but they have, uh, you know, a, a, um, the, the length of the legs is, the length of each of the corresponding legs uh, is scaled by some, by the same factor. So in other words, if you take the ratio of the legs, of the corresponding legs, you'll get the same ratio. So the ratio of uh, this leg L to this leg L prime is equal to the ratio of this leg M, sorry, M to M prime, so on and so forth. So that's the meaning of similarity, that 
um, you can call this something else, n, I don't know, n prime. So that the ratio of the leg, of the corresponding legs of the triangle uh, are the same. And I really shouldn't be saying legs because that re usually refers to right triangles. I, I should say the sides of the triangle. Anyway, uh, and yesterday we finally talked about circles and we introduced uh, the idea of circumference. I proved to you that the area of the circle is pi r squared. I, I proved this two ways. I proved this uh, using this notion of infinite, uh, an, an infinite number of, an, of infinitesimal triangles. Uh, and I also did this using calculus. I did a double integral. And so the seniors, the juniors and seniors, uh, would appreciate that more, the, the idea of the uh, double integral, the idea of the Jacobian. So, so some of these words I'm saying are not uh, relevant to many of you, but anyway, I, I proved the area of the triangle uh, of, the, of the circle is pi r squared using two different ways. And then we talked a little bit about the history of pi. And I encourage you to read that Wikipedia article about approximations of pi. It's really fascinating. And for those of you who like history, uh, you will find this to be a mini history lesson. So, I want to tie up the loose ends, so to speak, by uh, first revisiting uh, a little bit of conic sections and, and uh, really describing circles because circles are so important in, in describing nature. And I want to describe circles in a way that, um, that bridges our understanding of geometry and calculus, uh, sorry, geometry and algebra. Um, and I'd like to remind you that a circle is generated by taking, pair, by taking cuts of, of um, conic sections, so if I had a knife here and I sliced it like so, I, I would get the cross section of a circle. Uh, so, and, and these slices have to be parallel to the base of the cone here. So all these slices would give me uh, cross sections of the cone, which are all circles. And by the way, uh, many of you asked very graciously yesterday uh, if I saw the comet, and last night I did see the comet. Uh, I met from a distance with a physics professor at UTD uh, named Joe Eisen. He's a part high energy particle physicist, and he is a very serious amateur astronomer as well. So uh, he helped me find it. So, so that was really great. So I did see it. Uh, it was really beautiful. Um, anyway, so circles are really important in describing nature. And how do we express them algebraically? Well, it turns out that um, you might remember that we, we talked a bit about how in polar coordinates, a circle is defined by, okay, so, so do, do people remember when I talked about the polar coordinates r and theta? Uh, I, I think I talked about this on the last day of graphing. Um, on the last day that we talked about graphing, um, I talked about how you can define a circle as instead of using two parameters, x and y, you can just, you, you can get rid of one of the parameters. So I don't, I don't need theta to describe a circle in polar coordinates. And the way I would describe a circle in polar coordinates, say of radius one, is just the equation r equals one. This is the equation of a circle in polar coordinates. And it would look like this. And does this make sense? Yes, it does make sense because a circle, remember, is the set of points that are, that uh, is equidistant from one central point. So this is the central point C and all of the points on the circle are equidistant from it. All of them have a distance of one from it. So this makes sense. So this, so this is nice, right? And you might remember that uh, we, also found a way to transform from x to y to r and theta and vice versa. So the, the transformation was that x is r times the cosine of theta and y is r times the sine of theta. And if you inverted, if you inverted this transformation, uh, you would find that to describe r equals one, uh, you would have the equation x squared plus y squared equals one. So uh, really, the, really the, you don't even have to invert this, but if you, if you remember from our discussion of trigonometry, so, so basically what I'm trying to tell you to do is how to get from, uh, how to get uh, an equation for a circle, which is r equals one, in terms of x and y. And, and really the, the, the smart way to do it is to square x and y. So first I would take r squared, right? So r, r equals one uh, means the same thing as r squared is one. You, you, lo you lose a minus sign when you do that, but the radius is always positive. It's by definition positive. So it is no loss to make this step. And then I would um, square X and Y and add them up. So X squared is R squared cosine squared theta. Remember that cosine squared theta is the same thing as the cosine of theta all squared. This is just a notation. 
y squared is r squared sine squared theta. And then if you add these things up, you have x squared plus y squared is r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta. You can factor out an r squared and you'll have cosine squared plus theta, sorry, cosine squared of theta plus sine squared theta. And we talked about what this is. Does anyone know what cosine squared uh, theta plus sine squared theta is? Two cosine about? squared theta. Say that again? Two cosine squared theta. No, it's not. It's not two cosine squared theta because what you just said is that sine squared is equal to cosine squared and sine squared is not equal to cosine squared. Matthew is right. Matthew said one. Uh, so cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is one. This is the Pythagorean identity. And I proved this to you, if you remember, using the Pythagorean theorem. So anyway, if you don't remember, it's okay. But this is basically all one and one times r squared uh, is r squared. And so here is your equation for a circle. Uh, x squared plus y squared is r squared. And that's exactly uh, when, when the radius is 1, then it's x squared plus y squared is 1. So uh, this is the way to write a circle in algebra in uh, Cartesian planar coordinates. And so we can do the same games that we played. We can, uh, we can manipulate these things. We can, we can transform them in very similar ways that we transformed our old friend's functions. Note that this, a circle, is not a function. A circle is not a function because it does not pass the vertical line test, right? So if I drew a circle, uh, there are several of the same, um, like, like there, here there's one X point that is mapped to two different Y points. That by definition does not fall under the category of, of a function. So circles are not functions, but they follow the same rules as functions in that they transform the same way. And now remember, if I had a function F of X, and I wanted to transform it to say f of x plus three, okay, just to follow this little example. What, what does this plus three do? Does it move it to the left or to the right? Left. Yes, moves it to the left. And um, why does it move it to the left? Because the three is written inside the argument, right? This is in contrast to if I had another function what does this three do? Move it up. Yes. And uh, it moves it up because the three is written on the opposite side as the corresponding uh, variable, y. So, so the three affects the y values, but it's written on the other side of the equation. Here, the, the, the three is written on the same side as the domain, right? The, the, as the variable it affects, which is x. And therefore, it moves it to the left. But here you can see that the x and y's are all on the same side of the equation. And the three, the, the, you know, this plus three, this is written on the same side. So this is going to move it to the left. And look, the y here, the, the, the minus three, is written on the same side as the y. So this is in contrast to this. So can anyone tell me what, this should be squared. Um, can anyone tell me what this minus three does to the, to the graph? Move it up or down three units, if it's written on the same side. Moves it down. No, it, mo it moves it up. That's what oh, I was. So you're writing opposite. Yeah. 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 So the transformations go as the opposite, as we discussed uh, several weeks ago. Now they go as the opposite when you uh, write the transformation on the same side as the variable it's affecting. So this minus three is going to move the graph up, and so my parent circle, so to speak, I'll draw that in black. I'll draw it in green. Okay. My parent circle is x squared plus y squared is, is nine. And so my general, okay, I guess my, my general equation for a circle is this, right? Is, is r squared. So I can think of this as my, my parent circle. So based on this equation, what is the radius of this circle? If r squared is nine, what is the radius of the circle? Anyone? Three. Three, and so yes, yeah, so I know that my parent circle would have the radius of three. So this is three units, this is three units. So I haven't done any of my transformations yet. And I could draw, you know, the parent circle here. Okay, now I'm gonna apply the transformation. So this plus three makes the thing go left to the three. So here it is, everything got moved left to the three. So the new center of the circle is at, sorry, I forgot my negative signs here. Uh, negative three, zero. And now this minus three moves it up three. So now B 
the entire thing gets moved. And I'll draw this in red to show that it's the final graph. So this is this is what I'm going for at the end of the day. And you can see it looks like, like this. So I'm, I'm just uh, doing all these transformations in my head. The new center of the circle is at minus 3, 3. Uh, this is the point, you know, 0, 3. This is the point minus 3, 6. So you can do all these transformations in your head. It's not hard. Um, OK, so this red graph is the, is the final graph of the circle. Let's just do a few more examples. Uh, this is a bit harder. The numbers are a bit, uh, you have to think about them more abstractly, but uh, same exact problem. Um, OK, so someone tell me, what does the minus pi do? If I have my parent circle here, what does the minus pi do? Let's see here. Uh, uh, Alexis, Aruhi, anyone, Biruk, Brianna. I often go down the, let's see who's at the end. Monica is the last name on the alphabetically, I guess. Uh, Tanisha, anyone? Um, anyone know? Okay, Monica unmuted herself like for a fraction of a second. Fiona, Jessica, I know you all are here. Uh, what, does the, what does the minus pi do? Does it move it to the right or to the left? To the right. To the right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. In general, if I'm like, yeah, please, please. Yeah. Uh, when I'm just like waiting for people to respond, if you know the answer, just please respond just for the sake of the lecture. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it does move it to the right by pi. What is the radius of this circle? Just pi. Yes. So the radius is pi. So my parent circle, which I'll draw in green. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the parent circle has a radius of pi because pi squared is r squared, right? So solving for r gives you plus and minus pi for r, but we know that the radius is always positive. So uh, the radius is pi. So uh, so these points are all pi, uh, minus pi, minus pi. OK, and if this moves it right by pi, then this first transformation would give me this circle. So everything got moved right to the pi. The new center is at pi, and this is the point 2 pi. OK, now someone else tell me, what does this do? What does the transformation y minus uh, 2y, well, what does this minus 2y do? Does it move it up or down? Someone. Remember, the transformation is on the same side as the variable. So should it go as the variable or should it go as the opposite? Up 2 pi, very good, thank you. Up 2 pi. So this new graph here is going to get moved up 2 pi. And I'll do this in orange, I guess. OK, so here is pi. And here is 2 pi. So now the center is here. The bottom edge is here. This point got moved uh, up 2 pi as well, and so on and so forth. And this point was pi, so now this is 3 pi. So anyway, you can fill in the rest of the points. It's pretty self-explanatory, but here is your new circle. OK, so I hope this makes sense to people. Does, does anyone have any questions about any of these examples? how to transform circles, what the basic equation for a circle is. We haven't talked about dilations. And can anyone guess what a dilation of, like say I put like three here. Can anyone guess what that would do? Stretch out the circle. Yeah, and what does that give you? Like, like what would it do? Yeah. If you don't well, know it would, it would, It would stretch it out, so it would. Um, yeah, so what is a stretch out circle? Like. There's a name for it. Uh, oh, oh, like an oval? Uh, there's a more mathematical name for it. I forgot. You know, you know, I talked about it. It's, it's another conic section. Does anyone know? A loop. Ellipse. Very good, Matthew. Uh, and thanks for participating, Adi. I always appreciate it. So look, if I put, I don't know, one tenth here, boom. See how I've dilated one of the. Uh, Side. So, so anyway, so you can play with this more. You can make it even more narrow. You can make it, uh, you can make it huge, you know, so on and so forth. And this is how. Uh, so the comet that I showed you, the, the the diagram of the comet, it had a very uh, one of these numbers was huge, right? And I'll, I'll do it in this direction. One, you know, one of these numbers. That, so the dilation factor was small, but because the transformations goes the opposite when you have a transformation on the same side as the variable, uh, this number could be like I don't know. A big number. I have a question. Go ahead, Adi. So, 
if say like you were putting the stretch or the um, compression like inside one of the X, but would you also put it like would it be different if you put the if you put like say a three inside the X uh, yeah, it would. or would like and this. inside the Y? No, I'm saying like uh, would it be different if I put so if we go back if we go back to the like the last question that we were just doing. Okay. Here. I can't see it. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Ah, oh, I should okay. I'll just share my turn. Sorry. Okay, now can you see it? Yeah. So if I were it, would it be would it are you able to put like say that at 3 you put it inside X, are you also able to put that inside Y? Uh no, those are different things. So, so this, this graph is not the same as, uh, like, the, yeah, they're just totally different graphs. Is it, okay. you're asking? Okay, I'm not sure if, okay, I'm answering your question. No, th those are not the same thing. Yeah, th these would look different. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, uh, let's do one more example. Uh, of, uh, of a circle, and then we'll move on to the last topic of, of the week, and then you'll have your activity. Okay, so what's the radius of this circle? Anyone? Nine. Nine, and, and yeah, so good. You, you could have said negative nine, but negative nine, you know, radii by definition are not negative. So nine, and uh, you can think of, instead of transformations, you can think of uh, these points as defining the center of the circle. So there's a more general form uh, to describe the center. Say the center is given by the points H and K. So H comma K is the point of the center of the circle. You can think of the center of the circle, uh, you can think of the equation of the circle then as being of this form. So this is the most general form of the equation of the circle in Cartesian coordinates. So what is the center? Without thinking of transformations, just reading off, what, can someone identify for me what is H in this equation? Three. No, that's a common oh, mistake, yeah. not three. What is it? Look, there's a minus sign here. And there's a yeah, so it would be negative. Yeah, it'd be negative three. And what you should be thinking about is how to make this equation look like this equation. So the way I do that is I'd put a minus sign and then I'd say, okay, what do I need to put for me to get plus three? And the answer is minus three. So X minus minus three squared is the same thing as X plus three squared. And now that is of this form, right? So you can clearly see here that H is minus three and similarly, K, what is K? That would just be plugged in, so it would be pi. Yeah, exactly, good, so K is pi. So my center of the circle is at negative three, so ne negative three, pi, so pi is a little bit more than three, so somewhere out here, so negative three pi, and my radius is nine, so uh, this is not a very exact graph at all, but it has a bigger radius. Anyway, this is not great, but yeah, it sort of looks like so. Okay, sorry, that was really bad. Anyway, uh, you, you get the point, right? Any questions about how to graph a circle? The SAT people love doing this, okay? They'll, they'll just give you an equation of a circle and you have to find, you have to identify the circle, you have to identify the radius, and then you're done. Okay, lastly, I would like to generalize the Pythagorean theorem to you. And I have two ways of doing this and I want you to decide which way I show you. Um, when I say the word vector, Okay, who, who has heard of a vector before? It, let's see, if, is there a way? I wish I could take a poll. Do, do people- you enable- Go ahead, Adi. Uh, a vector uh, is a point that you can put on a unit circle that goes, uh, that flows in a different direction. Mm, a vector, first of all, is not a point. Okay, so first of all- Oh, yeah, well, okay. it's an angle. It can be angle or side. Okay, so a vector, Okay, can any, okay, instead of me defining, can anyone else uh, update Adi's definition? He said a, a vector is a point on a unit circle or an angle or a side on a it unit It has circle. a magnitude, a direction, and I think a, a speed. Okay, so, okay, that's really good. Uh, a vector, so the speed is the same thing. So if your vector is velocity, the speed is the magnitude. So speed is another way to think about magnitude. Magnitude, yeah. But okay, so when so when Adi talks about vectors, do, do other people feel vaguely comfortable? Do, do people have heard, people heard of vectors? I need some feedback from you all. 
If I don't hear anything, I will assume that everyone knows what a vector is. Are people listening? Are people there? I'm looking through you the probably just, You can probably just give like a general definition like with a circle in it. But Say like one, you could like just, you could just draw like the point like in the, in the A section, like the, the first quadrant to quickly like explain it. Okay, so, okay, that, that's, thanks Adi. I, uh, let's see. Okay, people say I heard it. Yeah, Adi, I'll, I'll, I'll give a basic definition. There are two ways to prove what I'm about to show. And one is, you. okay, this is actually good. Okay, I'll, I'll explain to you what a vector is. Okay, it would be my honor. And I will do this in a very simple way. That is, okay, so basically in, in nature, there are uh, numbers, right? So those things are called scalars. They're just numbers. Like if I asked you how old you are, say you're, I don't know, 15 years old, you would say 15. 15 is a scalar. If I asked you, um, what's the distance from your home to school, you might say three miles. Three is a scalar. These are numbers that stand by themselves, that they have units in nature, like miles, uh, years. Anyway, scalars are standalone numbers. Vectors are lists of scalars. So some of you who have taken computer programming, this is analogous to a string, you know, in computer programming, they call this a string. Yeah. It's a, it's a series, it's an array of characters. Okay, a vector is an array of numbers. So, okay, so I need people, I need, uh, let's see. People, tell me your age. Uh, as many people, just shout it out or type in the chat, your age. 16. 16, who else? 15. 15. Who else? Go. 14. Okay, good. 14. Okay, and uh, let's see. I'm reading off of the chat, too. We have 16, 17, 15. So, okay, anyway, that's good enough. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This is very good. Okay, this is a vector, right? So it's an array of numbers. It's a list of numbers. And uh, it has, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is a seven-dimensional vector. It has you know, seven, uh, seven dimensions, right? Uh, seven spots. You might, you might see this uh, as uh, any, we, we don't need to talk about really formally. Okay. But anyway, it's a list of numbers. And usually in nature, in our case, we're going to be dealing with you know, two dimensional vectors in the sense that your vector will have, okay. Usually people write vectors as a, as a, as in a, a vertical fashion. And usually because if we're confined to the plane, your, your vectors would be, you know, like two numbers, A and B, okay? Um, if you're in 3D, you might have three numbers, A, B, and C, okay? So anyway, um, what, what, do, what do these numbers mean, right? What, do, what does any of this mean? Um, well, just as you would have an X and Y, you know, coordinate, you can think of this as a vector, right? You can think, so this is a coordinate, right? X and, so in the X and Y plane, here's some point X and Y. Uh, you can think of this as a vector. So instead of thinking as, uh, of it as an ordered pair, you can think of it as uh, uh, an array of numbers. And that array has a magnitude, right? It has a length from the origin. And you might remember the distance formula, which is really just the Pythagorean theorem. The distance is just the square root of x squared, in this case, plus y squared. So this is the magnitude of the vector. And its direction is given usually by an angle theta. And that angle is usually measured from this axis. And in this case, the direction of the, of the vector is the tangent of y over x. Okay. So anyway, sorry, it's the inverse tangent of y over x. And you don't need to worry about the direction. But you, what you do need to know is that every vector, every array of numbers has a magnitude. So it has a sense of size. That, that is how long it is, right? So you can have a vector pointing in a different direction, but of the same magnitude. See, these vectors are equally long, even though they a point in a different direction. Uh, and you can, so, so you can have vectors of the same magnitude, you can have, but of different directions. You can have vectors of different magnitudes, but of the same direction. See these two vectors point roughly in the same direction, but their lengths are different. So that, these are the two things that, uh, that sort of quantify vectors, magnitude and direction. So I hope this is, um, this is sort of, somewhat familiar to people. And uh, the real application of vectors is in physics, uh, among many other things, linear algebra, so on and so forth. But you can model nature entirely using vectors. Uh, not entirely, but you, you know what I mean. Uh, you know, vectors, a uh, series of numbers are very nice in describing 
uh, the way nature works. And uh, one of the classic examples of a vector is velocity, right? This idea of velocity. Velocity, can anyone define velocity for me? Like the, like how fast you're going, I guess. But it's more than that. Speed in a certain direction. Speed in a certain direction. So the magnitude of velocity, the magnitude is the speed. So I can be going south, speed, speed. Speed, I can be going south, I can be going to Houston at 70 miles per hour, and I could also be going to Canada at 70 miles per hour, and I would have the same speed, I, right? I would have the same magnitude of velocity, but I would not have the same velocity because velocity is also characterized by direction. And this is the idea of you know, north, south, east, west, um, if you want to think about cardinal directions, or you know, x, y, z, if you're thinking of three dimensional Cartesian coordinates, anyway. So velocity is defined by both magnitude and direction. So one of the kind of trick questions on your, in your physics classes is, what is the velocity of someone going in uniform circular motion? It turns out that the velocity is zero because uh, your direction, so your speed is definitely not zero. You could be going at 100 miles per hour around this circle. But because you're returning to the same point, your, your average direction is zero. Right, you're you're average. You're 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 going all the way. You're going in every direction, uh, uh, and you're spending an uh, equal amount of time going in every direction. And because you land in the same point, your velocity is zero going in uniform circles. So anyway, this is a classic example. So velocity is a vector, right? Does that does that make sense? Velocity is an example of a vector. You can also have acceleration as a vector. You can have position as a vector. You can have magnetic fields as a vector. Electric fields. Of all of nature can be described, I mean, much of nature can be described using vectors. Okay, so this is a mini, so does this make sense? Are people happy with this idea of a vector? It's a list of numbers that has a magnitude and direction. Does that make sense? I need to hear from you, people. Yes. Okay, thanks, yes. thanks, Audie. I know Audie, okay, so some people in this class are, have seen this before, but I worry about the people who have not seen this before. So if you're confused about this, ask, go to Patricia today and ask her what a vector is. I'll warn her that people might be, literally, uh, I'll just text her after the lecture and say, uh, review your notes from high school about vectors. And she won't have any problem explaining what vectors is, but please do go, if you're confused about what a vector is, she would be very happy to explain to you what a vector is. Okay, uh, so why, does, why is this important? Well, it turns out that you can multiply vectors. So just as, okay, someone said they were 15, and someone else said that they were, I don't know. I want to know, say, say we had two, two people who were 15 and I wanted to know what the product of 15 times 15 is. I would know that this is 225. So uh, you can multiply scalars, right? And similarly, you can multiply vectors. And there are actually two ways to multiply vectors. So, so okay, does everyone see this is a scalar, this is a scalar, and I can multiply them, right? And there are different ways to denote this. You can use parentheses without a dot, you can use a uh, time sign, you know, you can use a dot. Anyway, uh, with vectors, it's more specific. And uh, with vectors, the easiest way, so to speak, to multiply vectors, say I had two vectors, like one, two, three, and three, six, nine. Okay, I had two vectors. There, the easiest way to multiply vectors is going across and then adding. So, and this is called the dot product. So there's also a type that we won't talk about that's not relevant to our discussion today that's called the cross product and it's another way to multiply vectors but it's less straightforward and it's only defined in three dimensions so it's less general. So they are like major, no they're not, they're not like, um, they're, they're a specific case of matrices. Okay, and the way you would multiply, the way you do a dot product is you would do three times one, so one times three, so, so this times this, right? multiplying, and then I'd add that to this times this, two times six, and then I'd add that to three times nine. And I would have three plus 12 plus 27, and whatever, 15 plus 27 is 42, I think. So anyway, so you can do this. Um, let's just do another example of a dot product. Okay, so, so this is the dot product of these two vectors. And the way that uh, by the way, the, the way vectors are denoted are with letters with an arrow on top. So I could call this vector A and I could call this vector B. And uh, A dot B, it's, it's pronounced A dot B would be 42 here. Okay, 
42, by the way, if anyone's read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the meaning of life. Okay, anyway, so this is how you do a dot product. And it turns out that um, these two vectors, if you were to plot them in, in uh, you know, uh, 3D, right, they would not point in the same direction. Th these two vectors are very different. A and B here, they don't point in the same direction. They don't have the same magnitude, right? They're, they're entirely different vectors. And it turns out that there is a angle. So I'll try to draw in 3D, not well, but say that this is vector A and that is vector B. There is some angle theta in between these two vectors. Okay. And it turns out that A dot B, instead of multiplying all the components, right, and, 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 and then adding uh, the corresponding components when multiplied together to give you 42, instead of doing that, you can also think of the dot product as, uh, of the vector as the magnitude of each vector. And that's denoted by these absolute value bars. This means the magnitude, in other words, the size of A, which I would find by doing, you know, one squared plus two squared plus three squared square root. This is the magnitude of A, right? Times the magnitude of B. So now, so this is a scalar, right? This is a scalar times the cosine of theta. And as to why it's the cosine of theta, I don't have time to show this to you, but it's not hard to show. Uh, okay, you can use your basic knowledge of trigonometry to do this. Um, okay, anyway, so, um, so this is the definition of the dot product. Uh, th th this is the more convenient definition of the dot product. And this is, uh, you have to understand the power of this. And, and I, can, I can show that to you by doing the same uh, multiplication um, using this definition. And uh, these numbers will be hairy in a sense. They're not going to come up nice because I didn't pick the best numbers. But you know, the magnitude of A would be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus. Th so uh, uh, this is 9 plus 4 plus 1. That's 14. And uh, the magnitude of B is uh, 9. I'm squaring these things. 36 plus 81. And I'm going to grab my calculator here. Uh, square root of 14 is uh, 3.74 roughly. And uh, square root of 9 uh, plus 36 plus 81 is 11.2, roughly 11.22. And then, uh, you know, this is not going to work as well because uh, it's hard to find the cosine of theta. Uh, I have to find the direction between these two vectors, and that's kind of tough. Um, but anyway, um, you'll have to take my word for it, I guess. Uh, I haven't really shown this to you. But anyway, the, the, the dot product is, it can be defined this way as well. So you take the magnitude of each vector and you multiply by the cosine of the angle between them. Okay. Uh, and so this is the definition I'm going to use to prove to you uh, or to derive another famous identity called the law of cosines. And it's actually very simple now that we've developed this notion of the dot product, law of cosine. This is a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. So if I had some general triangle and its sides were A, B, and C, and call this the angle C, you know, so we usually use capital letters to denote uh, the angle. Okay, and people give me a sec. Give me just a sec here. Um, this is your, I'm just gonna delay this a tiny bit. Okay, my, my email is not responding, as you can see here. Um, okay, I'm going to delay this uh, sending, if it'll work. Wow, this email is very slow. <laughs> um, okay, anyway, if, if you got if you got the email, don't, don't worry about it yet. Uh, okay, so usually we have capital, use capital letters to denote the angles. So this is angle C, this is angle B, this is angle A. Uh, so you know if, if you have a right angle, you have a very nice relationship between A, B, and C, right? A squared plus B squared is C squared. We'd like to find a general relationship, and we're given this angle theta. We'd like to find a general relationship for uh, the, the more general triangle. Okay, I don't know why this is not there. Okay, ignore it if you get it. Okay, <laughs> uh, in your email. Okay, so how am I gonna do this? Well, I'm going to do this by defining two vectors, A and B. So you, I used to have these sides that had some scalar length, A and B and C, but now I'm going to define two vectors and the way you add vectors is head to tail. Okay, so if, okay. Um, so I have the same triangle. And the way I'm going to draw this is so that I have, um, let's see here, uh, A. Yeah, so, so the way I've drawn this here would give me, this is vector A, this is vector B, and this is vector C. The way I've drawn this, the following is true. A minus B 
is C, the vectors, right? And you, you would add head to tail. So minus B, well, minus B is really a vector that points in this direction, right? So I'm adding head to tail. So this is the vector minus B. And you can see that when I add this thing, I got this vector C, it's just been displaced. Anyway, so, so this is how, this is what C is, right? And now I'm going to uh, take the magnitude, right? Uh, I'm not interested in the vectors themselves. I'm interested in the size. I'm interested in their magnitudes. So I'm going to take the magnitude of A minus B, okay? And um, let's see here. Give me a second. I'm going to also square that magnitude. Okay, so uh, when I square the magnitude, I would have a minus b. Uh, this is this is basically the same statement, right? And um, you know the reason I'm squaring the magnitude is is by inspiration. Yeah, so Adi posted the result. Uh, the, the reason I'm squaring the magnitude is is by I'm being inspired by the Pythagorean theorem, which is that a squared plus b squared is c squared. So I think squaring the magnitude would be a smart thing to do. So. Everyone sees, first of all, how I got from here to here. Okay, now you see how I got from here to here. I just squared everything, okay? And squaring this, this goes just, it's very similar to if these were scalars. This is, you know, A squared. Uh, for clarity, I'll leave out the absolute value bars, the magnitudes. A squared uh, minus two A, and here I'm gonna have a dot product. This is where the dot product is important. Two A dot B plus b squared. And what is a dot b? Well, according to my definition, right, according to my definition, a dot b is just a b cosine theta. And usually, instead of writing the absolute value of a, you just write a. Here, the absolute value of, of, of the vector a, you, you, you don't, this is, uh, this is the convention, right? You just write a. So, so this is a squared minus 2 a, B, cosine theta, here's my angle theta, um, plus B squared. And this is exactly the law of cosines. So this is the relationship between two arbitrary uh, legs of a triangle and the third leg. And so this is all equal to C squared. So this is a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. And you can verify the Pythagorean theorem from here. In other words, this is another derivation of the Pythagorean theorem when theta equals 90 degrees, right? Isn't that the case? If, if I let theta equal 90 degrees, I'd have, the, I'd have a right triangle. And when theta equals 90 degrees, you know that cosine of 90 degrees is zero, as you showed two weeks ago. And therefore, or I guess last week, when cosine of theta goes to zero, you're left with a Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so this is um, hopefully, uh, okay, so now you all can see my, okay, let me, let me go back to my whiteboard. Okay, so uh, does anyone have questions about this? I'm about to send you an activity um, I think you will still have plenty of time to do it. Ooh, I forgot to send the lecture link to people. I guess that's why people didn't join as early as I thought. Okay, people, um, my email is not responding, so I'll use another email account to send this. But do, do people have questions about what the dot product is, how I derive the law of cosines? Sorry if it was a bit rushed. I had to sort of introduce a lot to you in not much time. Does anyone have any questions, please? Okay, so now everyone go to your email. Oh, you know, there's a better way to do this. I can put this in the chat. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Okay, so now you're gonna have an in-class assignment and I'll give you five extra minutes because we're starting at 1045. It was initially a 20 minute assignment, which would have given you 2.5 minutes per problem. Um, okay, it is, sorry, everyone. Okay, I just sent. Okay, does everyone see in the chat? Go to the chat. And you will find. Okay, good. I'm giving everyone five extra minutes. Uh, please scan. When you're done, scan and email me. Okay, Burek doesn't see anything. I think you had the same problem last time. So now check your email. I just emailed everyone as well. Okay, so, okay, so it's there. Oh, okay, I don't understand. Yeah, the, the chat in Zoom is like really confusing to me. Uh, people, some people are seeing it, some people aren't. Okay, so for those of you who are not seeing it in the chat, please go to your email address uh, to, to check your email inbox and see if it's there. 